Singapore faces a number of critical choices about its future. Choices that are becoming ever more complicated by global geopolitics and economics. The growing might of China, the United States turning inward under President Trump, and tensions from North Korea to the South China Sea. How will the island nation navigate its challenging path ahead? This week on CNBC Conversation, I sit down with Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong. Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong, good to talk to you. You're heading to the US this weekend to talk to President Donald Trump next week. It will be your first visit to the White House under the Trump administration. What do you hope to accomplish during this visit? I hope to develop our relationship with the Trump administration and with the United States. It's a very sound relationship. It's based on a basic strategic congruence of views about the world, about the region, and deep cooperation over many years in the economic sphere, trade, investments, in the security and defense area. We train in the, S in the US, US forces use our facilities. We've fought together in Desert Storm and now in a coalition against ISIS. So there's, uh, it's a deep and multifaceted relationship. Mm -hmm. And I've met President Trump also in the G20 in Hamburg, but this is an opportunity to call on him in the White House, meet him, formally, and also to meet the officials as well as uh, people in Congress on the Hill. Any new deals you're hoping to do with the U.S. during your visit? Uh, well, we are hoping to sign an agreement f between um, SIA and Boeing to buy more aeroplanes. <laughs> is that a done deal, you think? I think that's a done deal. This is not the first time, like you said, you've met President Trump. You met him on the sidelines of the G20 summit earlier this year. Yes. You and I know he's been called many things. Yes. How would you describe him in your own words? Well, I think he's confident of himself. There are things which he wants to do. He has a very uh, set view of the world and of people. And uh, we will work with him. I mean, he has been elected. He has a mandate from the American voters. And he represents the United States of America. Well, it's been about 10 months since he took office. His election promise of America first. Do you get a sense perhaps he's backed down a little from his campaign rhetoric now that he's had time to settle in? I think every administration has a settling in process. And there's always a, an adjustment between what you can say during a campaign and what you find are the possibilities and the imperatives when you win the election and you enter the Oval Office. And the Trump administration is not different. Perhaps the adjustment is bigger in this case because uh, Trump represented such a, a radically different uh, rethink to so many things which the American um, policy intelligentsia had considered to be shared uh, conventional mm -hmm. wisdom. But reality and the forces of events down on every president. But do you worry about an America turning inwards? We have long depended on an America which has got a clear sense of its stakes in the world and how much it depends on the world as well as how much the world and its allies and friends depend on the United States of America. And we hope this will continue. Nonetheless, well, since he took office, one of the first things he did was to pull the US out of TPP. Now, you've expressed disappointment at the moon. Where is TPP minus the US now? Is it still going forward? What's the status? We are still talking. The 11 remaining members are still discussing how we can take it forward and we hope we'll be able to get somewhere. Is there anything happening behind the scenes, whether it's Singapore, ASEAN or Asia, that's working to convince the US to rejoin the multilateral trade pact? I think uh, the president has made his position quite clear. He's made a formal decision. And I think we leave it at that. I don't think it is um, the time yet to start new initiatives uh, multilaterally with the United States. Perhaps one day the time will come. With the US pullout, is it only natural you think that countries like Singapore and ASEAN now pivot more towards China and its Belt and Road Initiative to compensate for the US abandoning TPP? I think we, would have, we are paying a lot of attention to China one way or the other. They are a big factor in the world. They are successful. They are growing. They want to grow their influence. And all the countries in Asia want to be their friend and want to benefit from China's development and success. 
Um, the TPP would have enhanced our relations across the Pacific as well as relations and the interdependence among all the TPP partners, mm. which included many major economies, the Japanese, the Australians, the United States, NAFTA, Canada and Mexico. Uh, there is no TPP, but the volume of trade nevertheless is substantial and we hope that it will still be able to grow. Mm. When do you think TPP will come about? I think do you have a time frame? No, I, I think th there, there's a tide in these affairs and um, if you miss the tide, you may be able to achieve the same objective one day. It will have to be in a different form, uh, in a completely different way. But it's delayed in the process? Yes, of course, it will take um, several years before you can come back to it and the stars have to come back into alignment. We know that President Trump is going to visit Asia next month. He will attend APEC and the ASEAN-US summit. Yes. What are the chances of his talks getting hijacked by the North Korean issue? I'm sure that will be on their agenda. Uh, it's very high on the US agenda. President Trump himself is very seized with it. And ASEAN is also uh, focused on this, although ASEAN's influence on matters uh, must be limited. We've had a war of words, an exchange of words between President Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Trump has labeled him, I'm sure you know this, madman, rocket man. Are you worried about North Korea and its provocations? I think brinksmanship has been part of the North Korean uh, issue for a long time. I mean, it's part of the game. You uh, make a threat, you posture, you uh, make a risky move. You hope that the other side will then do something to placate you or to uh, give you some advantage mm -hmm. in exchange for good behavior. And then after some time, it starts again. So it's not the first time. What's different this time is that North Korea has more nuclear weapons. They've conducted more nuclear tests. They're developing their missile technology, particularly the ICBM technology. And so the risks are higher. But the danger is not just the immediate alarms, but also the longer term uh, trends which are set off in Northeast Asia if uh, things persist in this direction. Because with North Korea going this way, the South Koreans must, are asking themselves, what can we do? I mean, uh, we have de the, the Americans have removed the tactical nuclear weapons from South Korea. Now, what do we do? Do we ask the Americans to bring them back? Do we, the South Koreans, think of developing some capability? 60% of uh, South Koreans now think they should have some kind of nuclear capability. So that's, that's in South Korea. Japan too, which has a very strong anti-nuclear public stand, uh, sentiment, uh, will be forced to think about the possibilities and the unthinkable and what, what may they need to do. And one former defense minister has said recently, well, perhaps we should ask the Americans to bring their nuclear weapons and put them in Japan. And the government says, no, we shouldn't. But these are thoughts which cannot be completely suppressed. And if, in fact, it goes that way and South Korea and Japan go closer to being nuclear powers or actually cross the threshold, uh, it means a different strategic and security balance in Northeast Asia. More risky, mm -hmm. more tense, and the Chinese will be very alarmed. And I don't think that you make for a safer world. There will be implications elsewhere mm -hmm. in the world. But from where you sit, do you want the U.S. to have more of a military involvement here in the region? No, the U.S. has always had a presence in the region. The Pacific Command is one of their major commands around the world, and the, with the Seventh Fleet and with the, the other U.S. forces uh, based in. But at a time like this, do you want them more involved militarily? I, I think that they are not well. They will never have enough military forces for, from the point of view of the admirals and their generals. Mm -hmm. But what is most important is not just the amount of forces you have in theater, but the political will and the focus and the political direction which is set in Washington, but also in the United States, that to know that Asia is important to the US, that the US will cultivate its relations with Asia, that the U.S. will continue to contribute to the peace and stability of Asia. And this is something you want to get out of your visit? To well, the it US is something which I say on every visit to the U.S. and it is a message which bears repeating because I think it is a truth which is not going to change in the short while and which needs to be made a reminder 
because the U.S. has so many other preoccupations, domestically and also internationally in other parts of the world. Coming up next, China's growing political and economic clout. How will Singapore defend its own interests when dealing with this awakening giant? Our conversation with Singapore's Prime Minister continues after this break. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.